I am so excited to welcome Stephen Terrell to this podcast again. Stephen, thank you for being here for a third time. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I am so grateful to be here with you, Shelby. I had to, I had this huge smile on my face because not only were we coming on, but at the same time, my dog started barking. So I always think of you and I, I think of, of my dogs and our relationship there, but it is my pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Okay, wait, why do you think of me when you think of your dogs? <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of weird, but <laughs> um, you know, I think of you because you are probably the most empowered by your dog of anyone I know. And then your brother's dog and all the dogs and how you, you know, my dogs, you know, every I just think that that's a cool connection that we share. And maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't even know we were sharing it, <laughs> but it is kind of a cool connection. And I, I appreciate, I think if we can't care about dogs, makes it more, you know, people come next or it just, maybe people come first in some people's lives, but I think my dogs come first a lot yeah. of the time. So, yeah. I do. I think when I ask you how you are, usually I follow it up with how's Jackson or how's Cash? Well, Cash is the one barking right now and he's down, he's back over here. I pull my, he's leaning against me wondering what we're doing. So he, they're good. Everybody's good in this house. No, complaints. I don't even know your kids' names. I just know your dog's names. It's all right. Uh, Luke and John Michael are not, they're okay, but they're, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're good. Oh, well, we are fortunate enough to be recording on the day of the big eclipse and you're in Texas and you might want, do you feel up for sharing how your day has been? Yeah. Do you want me to show the photo? Uh, yeah. Oh, the it's on a podcast, will it? Or well, we have a YouTube also. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right. I'm going to show you what I got to experience. This was a little bit earlier this afternoon. Uh, this was right over my backyard. And uh, we got about a little over two full minutes. The whole uh, thing was about two hours from the beginning to the end. And it was so amazing because all of a sudden, everything went dark, dark. And the the lights, the, the garden lights that are all night and day came on and it was like oh this is strange and i thought this is god this is so strong and so powerful and i just felt it all through my body and i, I my one of my neighbors said oh my god right in the middle of it and i heard it and i was like oh this is too funny but uh yeah i'm just grateful that i was able to experience it. it's the first time in my life i've ever ever been in a total eclipse so Thank you. Yeah, super powerful. Uh, nothing weird happened. I did hear right in the middle of it, alarms going off. So some people's alarms band went off, but nothing big. Wow. No, I'm yet. Still, no aliens have pulled me up yet, but I'm waiting. <laughs> My bags are packed. I'm going to be on Mars. Oh, I'm pretty sure they already grabbed you and put you down here sometime. <laughs> Oh, they dumped me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, that is so cool. I was up on Mount Bachelor. My face is still red from it was sunny up there. And it just it was kind of just dark for a little while. And then it became brilliantly bright. And it was the sound of the birds changed. It was pretty. It got really quiet. Mm -hmm. I it was funny, you mentioned my sons. I immediately text them both. They both came into my heart at that moment and into my mind. And I just, I love you so much. And went to both of them. And I, I think it was a moment of unity. Mm -hmm. I think it would just you bring the world into unity. I, it would be such a wonderful place. Yeah. 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 It was interesting. I received texts from like most of my neighbors about mm. it. And I mean, some of them I rarely talk to. So it was very unifying in yeah. that kind of sense. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. 
How is it for you to kind of sit in an experience like that for two hours? Is it easy to feel your nervous system settle and really be present? You know, I have been doing sits, contemplative sitting for years. So I can pretty well snap my finger and pop over into a place of quiet. But today it was different because it was like, I could feel a bit of my sympathetic activation going up, like what's going to happen, you know, got to have my glasses on or I'm going to lose my eyesight. I'm going, well, I've already lost part of it. So what's it, you know, put my glasses on. I want to get some pictures and yeah. You know, there's something about that space between noise and silence not the silence and not the noise it's the moment between where i recognize healing has occurred in my life because i now know that space as something uniquely different and indescribable yeah yeah between silence and noise. Yeah. Hmm. That's so cool to hear. Mm. I know for so many folks, it can be hard to even sit still for three minutes and really be there in these big moments or small moments too. You know, in Transforming Touch, we uh, were in Ireland and Ellen was with me to... Uh, Dr. Keating oftentimes travels the same directions. And uh, it was like, without even thinking, we kind of moved into healing silence for the first time that it ever happened. And the two minutes just, because people didn't want to cut off the table and they didn't want to move. And the whole room went, like somebody put the brakes on. And we realized, oh, this could be a powerful piece. And it's funny because in consultations, one of the very first most common thing I get is my client can't tolerate the two minutes of healing silence. And I'm, and I'm always kind of go, well, you realize they probably didn't tolerate the whole session. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because I can't, you know, in the silence at the end of the session is when we're, everything's writing. If we were, you know, if we were doing tech writing, we would, you know, it's all and then printing into our systems. Yeah, silence, mm -hmm. is, silence is glory for me. Yeah. Yeah. It, for me, it's such a sign of healing also to be able to sit in the silence and the more I've healed the less I have the tv on all the time the radio well not the radio the spotify you know all of the background noise it's much more comfortable to just be moving through the silence yeah I love that I love to hit the off switch and be sitting there oh this is what this room is like without a bunch of noise mm -hmm. yeah well, we didn't actually introduce you because you're so famous. I just imagined everybody listening knows who you are. <laughs> and so you were just talking about a transforming touch training. Yes. Will you describe a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I am Stephen Terrell. You did say that. And uh, that rings true. Uh You know, that's an interesting question because my mind goes to that repetitious speech. Oh, mm -hmm. I've said this a thousand times, blah, 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 blah. But who I am at this moment feels very different. Yeah. Transforming touch is a regulation focused modality. We don't focus on symptoms. We don't focus on pathology. We don't, diagnosis is thrown out. We really come in to the space between the noise and the silence. Mm -hmm. 
And in that space, we support a nervous system um, that may be dependent on multiple um, ways of staying safe and multiple ways of using external devices to stay safe internally and bring about change by supporting it and realizing that as practitioners, my relationship is more important than my knowledge. And that if I can be quiet enough, I can hear what my client may have been waiting all their life to say. And so this modality came out of a weird, strange need that I was working with foster kids and adoptions, mostly kiddos. And things would get better, but they never got better enough. Hmm. Clients. And so transforming touch kind of blossom grew, blossom grew, change, 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 grew, change, change. She used to be the biggest joke that you need to attend every training because everyone is different. Um, it's a little bit more stable, but it's always growing and changing. So it isn't concrete, it's fluid. I can attest uh, to this. Yes, thank you. And <laughs> out of that fluidity is something, something good can happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's who I am. Yeah, and transforming touch can also be done as transforming presence yeah. on Zoom. And it's also wildly effective. I mean, almost like eerily effective. It is eerie. And you know who was the biggest crit critic of that occurring was me. <laughs> I said, this is no way. No way will this work when the pandemic happened. But thank you, COVID. Uh, as weird as that may be, uh, it took us into a place of working online that showed me that, you know, there's more than one way to get to healing. There's more than one way. And just bringing all the multiple ways into focus and letting whatever work work and realizing that everyone can't travel to see a therapist. And we've kind of opened up all over the world. Not huge but growing people in Australia, people in Italy, people in Ireland, people in France, people, you know, in the UK, it's just kind of these little groups, Japan, just go poof, poof, poof. And it's just kind of happening, which is, it's, it's it really is a grassroots movement in many ways that people are saying, you know, I tried going to someone who tried their best to get me to change using my left brain and it didn't work. But now all of a sudden here I am in a right brain, the right brain, finding what I was missing and able to repair. It's a good yeah. thing. I mean, I have been practicing transforming touch and transform uh, somatic regulation resilience. Both are modalities you teach. Yes. for five years now and just in the last year maybe six months I've been baffled <laughs> because you know I've been supporting clients with trauma since 2005 I was became a specialist in 2011 and I'm like doing less than I ever have and people are coming in after one, two, three sessions, just in tears going, I have never, ever, after 20 years seeing psychotherapists doing all of the healing modalities, felt this safe. I've never felt my body respond so quickly. I've, I've never noticed my anxiety shift, you know, just in one, two, three sessions. And I'm sitting there going, are you sure? You know, <laughs> like I, it's taking me a minute to catch up because it's really about once we can support that regulation in relationship, circle and underline. Yes. Something massively and profoundly healing can happen. And it's not about the knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's so it's 
it's about doing less and yeah. really being with. Yeah. It's just mind blowing. Mm, I appreciate. It. Yes, yes, it is. And you know, I still argue with myself and say, "Is this really?" You know, I shake my head and I go around in circles just like everybody else can do. And I get then I go, "Whoa!" All it takes is one client for me to see one client. I go, "Oh yeah, this is it." This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I get back on that bus of understanding that less is more. Every time, less is more. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard you say a lot that I appreciate and I still catch myself around is that no trauma is bigger than another. Ever. And we can we can be talking about our clients or ourselves and just, oh, this this one has a lot of trauma. You know, yeah. and I'd love to hear you speak on that. Well, you know, if I had a soapbox, I would stand on it right now. Because thank you. Thank you. That was very <laughs> giving. Thank you. Um, it is my one of my hugest pet peeves is for someone who anyone, not just someone, anyone who says Oh, I have a client and my client has the worst. Oh, they have such a huge trauma background. Or, oh, my trauma is worse than everybody else's. And I just want to spit nails. Mm -hmm. I really want to spit nails because my experience is somebody can walk outside this door and get caught in a thunderstorm and that lightning went poosh. And for that moment, that trauma can evolve into something that's crippling and somebody become completely disabled from moving forward and autoimmune diseases and all sorts of things can happen from just a burst of a thunder. And someone else can walk out the door and there'd be a mass shooting and they come back in and they go, wow, that was really bad. I was sorry to hear that that happened and show zero trauma. Mm -hmm. So for me to imagine that I have the ability to compare one person's trauma to another and that I know for sure that, oh, yeah, in the 12 billion traumas on this earth, yours is the worst. It's ridiculous because all trauma, when we're talking about developmental trauma, regular, you know, shock trauma, doesn't matter, but all trauma cannot be compared. Not even through two people that are in the same experience can we compare the reactions ever, ever. It's totally different. So once we get that off the table, because I do believe that that's a way that a therapist protects themselves. I think that's how I say, you know, this case is so big, I probably can't help them. Or it scares me to try to help them. Yeah. or to support their system is outside my wheelhouse. And so it's like redefining it and bringing it back around and saying, nobody's worse. There's nothing too big, whether it's huge or it's little, big T, little T, who cares what T? We don't care. They all respond when we come in and we bring in regulation mm -hmm. from a caring heart. Interesting enough, it just thundered. <laughs> that's funny it just thundered so uh oh uh, aliens are coming aliens are coming or trauma we don't know which one they both could be riding hand in hand but yeah isn't it and what a disgrace i do to you yeah you shelby when i say oh your your trauma is so bad shelby how do you make it through life all i'm doing is enabling you to not heal i have heard that from many therapists you're you know i was told you will have to be in therapy the rest of your life because i was presenting with such incredible disorganized attachment did i ever tell you about how i no. went to a somatic trauma therapist group here in bend oregon and when we went around we all raised our hands to say what we do and I, I said, you know, I, I love working with folks that have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And it was like a record skipped and everybody turned 
And they were like, wow, we're going to send you all of our clients. How can you even do that? Oh, they just like went off about all these horror stories about their clients that they imagine have borderline personality disorder and how bad and how awful. And I had, I actually had tears come down my face and I had to educate them. I'm like, this is complex trauma. This is developmental trauma. This is very healable. And many people suffer from uh, borderline or traits of borderline personality disorder. Don't get the treatment they need because of this. <laughs> and they're afraid to come to you because of this. Because it's so bad and it's so big and it's so untreatable and so unhealable. Um, it was just heartbreaking. Yeah, oh. Some of these were 40-year clinicians, psychotherapists. Well, when I was in grad school, my one of my professors, you know, there were probably 80 or 90 of us in a classroom. It was a big classroom. Said, never have more than one and two at the most borderlines in your practice. And I thought, oh, I'm afraid of these people. Oh, I might be one of these people, but I'm afraid of these people. And, and then, uh, yeah, now 100%, 100% of everyone I see in traditional psychotherapy could be diagnosed or could have been, mm -hmm. let me say that, could have been diagnosed with borderline personality because they have so much trauma yeah yeah, yeah. talk yeah. about spinning nails oh yeah and i love that disorganized people say oh i just want to work with secure attachment and i'm like why would secure attachment be in in therapy unless it was something <laughs> free <Yeah. laughs> so boring <laughs> oh yeah yeah i oh, i prefer disorganized it's where I live best, where I swim the best and enjoy life the most is working with a population that a lot of folks don't want to, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, uh, it's easy for me to sit with that, but also in part because of your work, you know, we take the pathology out the and point. I wonder if you could speak to that. I mean, sometimes labels and boxes are, can be really helpful and empowering for people. But also, um, when we take the pathology out, I feel like it opens us to all the possibilities of healing. Yeah, I thought we went, as soon as you asked that question, the possibilities, when I put you in a box, there are no more possibilities. The only one who benefits from you being in a box is you. Because that's who you are now. And this is where I live. And life can't be any different. It's going to be the same pathetic life every day, day in and day out. Because in the box, there aren't any possibilities. When I say you have borderline personality disorder, and I put you in that box. There aren't even... Yeah, let's get everybody out of the box. Mm -hmm. You may be crazy as a Betsy bug. Enjoy it. <laughs> There's something oh. about it that is serving. Yeah. And that is really deeply important. Oh, yeah. It's very self-serving to be. You know, I say this too a lot, that the one person who doesn't want you to get better, Shelby, is Shelby. Because Shelby, based on the way we homogenize with our whole harmony in our systems, the way everything works within us, says that I have my system figured out a place that if as long as I go back to this every time, and this is how I operate, I'm safe. It decides what's safe, which is rarely a safe place. So, yeah, of course, our systems are going, no, 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 when we're trying to heal. That's why it's such a mm, an elastic thing. You know, we hear the word fluidity a lot lately. 
And I would like to hear the word elastic more often because healing is very elastic. You go a little bit this way, a little bit this, but you know what? Have you ever had a pair of elastic pants? Yeah. Eventually the elastic wears out. Mm-hmm. And there's just more room all of a sudden. <laughs> And we call this regulation. Regulation. Yes, yes, yes. 2.0. Yes, yeah. That set point is so strong. Oh. It's just, you know, if you if we're living in that collapsed state that I can't, I, you know, I just am helpless. Mm. There's something about that that is trying to keep us safe, right? <laughs> Maybe did keep us safe. Probably. It's like, ooh, a little more, a little more mobility a little more energy a little more alive is ah, set yeah. point you know that elastic is so strong it is so strong but eventually it gives out shelby yeah eventually there's lots of room mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can't last forever cannot last forever it's really you know it's complicated because we develop these symptoms, if we're going to call them symptoms, we call them defensive accommodations because they're keeping us safe. Looking at it totally different and saying, oh, these negative behaviors or positive behaviors are keeping me safe. They're crutches to my wounded parasympathetic response because my parasympathetic couldn't find the sympathetic to calm us down without support. And so these are how we're supporting it. So people want to look at that and go, let's get rid of this. And we're down here going, no, 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 no. We're coming into the parasympathetic through relationship, through caring, through compassion, empathy, all of those things, building somatic trust, creating an atmosphere of trust that can't go wrong. And there we are. And then they begin to fade. Do they disappear? As they fade, we no longer see them. They don't go, boom, this one's gone. Boom, this one's gone. They all fade about the same speed mm -hmm. to oblivion. Mm. Yeah, it's so much nicer mm -hmm. doing that through regulation work instead of trying to get there cortically. You know, I... I often describe this work as, you know, you have been working so hard for so long and there's so many modalities that actually ask folks with trauma to work with, I just ask anyone to work hard when they don't have to, it's, yeah. it's time to rest and to support. Wow. And we can do that with this connected attachment based somatic support. Yeah. Well, how do you work? We both know um, our autoimmune system begins to break down. We begin to attack ourselves because we've been working so hard. You know, if, if I'm a therapist in this office and you're a therapist across the hall and it takes me, all I have each day is because 70% of my day is about safety. I only have 30% a day to evolve with relationship and all of the other things in life that are good. And you're across the hall and you have 80% a day that you can invest in good. You're going to have a waiting room full of folk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be struggling because I'm working so hard to keep up with the people who have the same credentials, the same everything. We work hard. We're going to break down our system. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, from the A study, the adverse childhood experience study is over and over proven over and over and over and over that heart disease, diabetes, they're all sitting there waiting. Earlier death, waiting. Mm -hmm. All of that sitting there waiting for, you know, developmental trauma, those who have lived through it or those who are living with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we talked about this last time a little bit, but, you know, I, I want to also mention there are some times when boxes and labels are helpful, you know, like neurodiverse, 
learning that and realizing that about myself was the first time I ever stopped shaming myself about how I am in this world or Enneagram four or secure, you know, all these different things. It's like, how do we balance that with what we're talking about? You see what's funny. And now I'm going to challenge you. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> because you know, we're both neurodiverse. So and we should, Enneagram 4. We're both Enneagram 4. <laughs> we're both pretty pathetic when it comes to those. But disorganized. I, disorganized. Tell me, get on the bus. So, you know, I find neurodiversity as taking me out of the box. Yeah. It made the whole world brighter when I realized, oh, Enneagram Forbes. <laughs> I hate Enneagram four, but yes, but I understand it that oh yeah, it's a struggle. I'm always beating up myself before anybody else gets an opportunity. You know, it's a struggle. So I'm saying we're not in boxes. We're out of boxes, Shelby. <laughs> Come out of the box. Don't be in any boxes. We <laughs> That just means that we have a new filter on our the way we see the world. And it's a safer filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, not everybody would say that. They go, oh, you're neurodiverse. Here's your checkbox for autism. Here's your checkbox for ADHD. Here's your how here's how we're going to treat that highly sensitive stuff. Yes. Or, you know, yeah. you're so I guess it's in how we hold it and how we look at it. Well, you should come with me. You know, you should come with me because when I'm teaching and people first meet me that, you know, they don't really know me until I walk into a classroom and then they start to, I'm very open and out of the, the neurodiverse closet. I am, you know, I say I have neurodiversity. I'm on the spectrum. You know, all of these things are who I am. And the ability that I have to be in front of you right now for someone who was so shy and so every possible emotionally, physically abused and pushed around because of the way I looked or the way I talked or the way I walked, you know, and now, you know, yeah, I'm shy as I'm still shy, but I know I'm shy and I can hold that shyness and go, okay, you can come with me. You know, that part of me doesn't have to disappear. Come on with me. We're going to go in front of a classroom of people we don't know. And we're going to do the best job. What has happened with that is interesting. The mean person scenario is, I should write a book on this. Used to be, there was always someone in every class that was mean. And sometimes it would be two people, but they were mean, Shelby. I mean, mean and nasty and had their own agendas. Yeah. And I would get so hurt by that, that I would just shrink inside and I would over apologize, which, you know, kind of a four gift is to over apologize. And I would just, please, I'm so sorry I did that. I should have never done this or never done until it was insane. And when I embraced neurodiversity and spectrum disorder was like my best friend, I don't have any mean people anymore. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't have any mean people. They don't show up in my trainings. They don't show up in my life anymore. Yeah. And if they do show up, it's so intermittently brief. I mean, it's so rare that it's so brief, they're gone. The student will drop out the first day. And I'm yeah. like, oh, may God be with you. Do you think that's because you were able to kind of welcome yourself home in a different way? I love that. We could do a movie on that one. Write the book and the movie. The book and the movie, Welcome Home. I love you can write the book. I'll do the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We'll be co we'll co-author and co-direct and write a movie. Yeah. That'd be fun. Produce. That's never gonna get done. No. <laughs> <laughs> All the way we get done is if we hire someone else to do it for us. <laughs> you should know that by now. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about pain versus suffering. We're going to shift into that a little bit. 
Uh, I heard you mention it when we were talking before the podcast, and it seems so important. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it was kind of like, I I know for a fact that if I use, I like to use a set scale. A set scale is zero to 10, zero being least and 10 being most, right? So if I use a set, 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 if I use a scale of <laughs> zero, zero to 10, and I think about trauma, developmental trauma, and I go back to someone's childhood, and that person says to me, a little bit is coming through, but they don't always know the story. But we're starting to get a little bit coming through. What I've become aware of is developmental trauma, every incident's a 10. Mm. Every rupture is a 10. So if every rupture's a 10, and I'm a baby, I can't process a 10. No. So maybe I'll process a 2. So that tells me that 8 tenths are still there hidden in my body. So as I begin to heal, eight tenths is going to come to the surface. That means that if it was painful back then. Ouch. Yeah, exactly. Just my a heart. little bit of crying came out back then, but now all of a sudden, oh, oh, oh starts happening and that's what i see over and over so i think that if you're willing to have life different and to, to experience healing in your life that you're going to experience suffering well there's going to be a lot of pain so i'm going to play both words here because i've been challenged on both words from different groups of people say so how can it be suffering or how could it be pain and i don't want my client to feel either one go really slow and they'll never will because you'll never walk through the trauma but if you're going to be doing developmental trauma you don't know where you're going and if you're on a path going up to that mountain up there you could fall in a lake and in the middle of that lake is the trauma and you're going to go right through the center of it Hmm. that's how developmental trauma healing works so a tense means we're going to have a lot of pain coming to the surface because it's old and we don't always understand it we're going to suffer that pain we're going to you know it's not like we bang our finger and we go oh i hurt my finger it's like oh my finger's been hurt for years and years and i've been oh and, oh you know, suffering. So pain and suffering. And you and I, when we were talking, you were going to tell me <laughs> your definition of the two. So I'm more excited to hear your definition than for me to even talk about it. So I want to ask you, what's your definition of those two words? It was so helpful as a four <laughs> when I <laughs> learned about this, because I sure didn't know how to suffer. <laughs> so there's a, in the, insight meditation community the theravada buddhist lineage a very common teaching about the two arrows and when we're mindful of the pain we can be mindful that it's pleasant unpleasant neither we can be mindful of sensations we can be mindful of the emotions that arise um, and or and we can be mindful of the suffering that comes in response to that pain so the first arrow is the pain it's kind of clear. And then the second arrow are the stories we wrap around it, the reactions we have to it. And we have a little bit more ability, especially as we grow our resilience to respond differently. And I found with this work, what really increases that is that caring hearted connection. We can hold suffering when we can hold suffering together and make so much more space for it so that it doesn't overwhelm us and eventually it just becomes the pain instead of the pain and the suffering okay 
All right, I took notes. I'm going to have to take that and say that I came up with it, even though it was it's hundreds of thousands of years old, I'm sure. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting because someone who challenged me said, why don't you resource your clients? Why are you resourcing for when they have a tough time? And what I say to them is that you're doing a reenactment. Mm. I tell you, you need a resource to go through this pain and suffering. That's the reenactment where you've already been to get you here in the first place. Because you did all of this by yourself. Oh. When you banged your finger as a baby, no one picked you up and rocked you. Nobody held you close to their heart and said, it's going to be all right. Nobody kissed your boo-boo. No one was there for you. So now all of a sudden I'm going to tell you, when you feel this pain, you should jump up and down 32 times in a but, circle. Well, you are the resource. Yes. <laughs> you are resourcing. Yes. You got it. That's what I said. We don't do anything except us because we're now creating a new experience where I can be in pain and suffering and you don't turn your back on me. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. embrace me and say, I'm right here with you. Yeah. And I listen to your story without me becoming curiously nosy, but curious if you're okay. Which is a whole different curiosity than now. What color was the car you were in? Mm. It's about the curious of, yeah, are you all right? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. I'm holding space for both of us because it has to be both of us. I can't just hold space for you. I have to hold it for both of us to experience it and co experience a resonating experience, a coherent experience, whatever popular fad of the week words we want to use but it's really about me and you being together yeah. in this and you are guiding us and i'm listening it's such a different experience sitting with trauma in this way i have s several friends who have called in very very overwhelming circumstances i don't have the clinician hat on and just mm. i just get like trauma, you know, story, story, story. And I am just wrecked. I had a migraine this weekend from just not having that space to really sit together like I would with a client. So many people say, oh, you're a trauma specialist, trauma therapist. Life must be so hard. That must be so hard. And I'm like, it's deeply healing. I, in the session, we, st we slow down we pause, we make sure we're present. We're here. We don't just vomit it all out in 50 minutes and then play cleanup later. No. We well, make sure we're together. Yeah. And people say that they'll say, Oh, how do you decompress when you go home at night? What do you, what do you do? To... And I just kind of smile and say, I usually just thank God because a whole lot of stuff happened today that I had nothing to do with. Except my role as a caretaker. My role as someone with compassion and empathy. And that's not draining. No. Only when I want to fix do I get drained. And I fall into that sometimes. I want to fix some people. Oh. As a four, you know this. If somebody calls and says, you're the only therapist in the world who can help my child who's been, you know, horrible things have happened to my child and you're the only person on the earth, I can't tell you how many people I added on to a full schedule. Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. We have to be able to be present. Yes. To do this work because it's not about the knowledge. It's not about what we're doing. It's about how we're being together. Yeah. And for me, coming from that background where there wasn't good relationship growing up, 
this is new for me. It's new for me to be in relationship with clients, to be in relationship with students, to be in relationship with other professionals. It's new. Yeah. yeah. Me also. We're we're a good club. <laughs> I love it. I had written down to ask you, you know, so this is a treatment without words. Mm -hmm. And I have so many people which makes sense, trying to make sense of this. How, what are you, are we visualizing something? Are, are you trying to like change, fix, manipulate? Are you putting energy in my body? If I'm not talking about what happened to me, if we're not digging to the roots, how does this treatment without words actually heal trauma? Well, you know, the way it works is that you have the answer not me and so i you may need to talk and i'm going to let you talk i have clients to talk 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 never ever i found quiet yet but they're moving towards it and so the experience of someone being with you is so powerful without an agenda I don't know which one's worse. I don't know if this part, that story you're telling is to protect you from the story underneath it or the story above it, behind it or in front of it. I don't know. But what I do know is that you're going to know the answer. So when they say to me, well, what does this mean? During the session, my right arm was going flap, 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 flap. What does this mean? Am I trying to hit someone? Do I need to push against something? Do I need to complete an experience? And I go, no. What was it? I don't know. What do you think it was? Well, I, and then they go right into a story and have a full explanation. I know that's it. That's what it was. It's Shazam. so genius. Shazam. And I don't have to pretend to know what every body movement in the world is, but I do know this, that a lot of people are hurt by the word completion. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't complete it, you can't have dessert. If you don't complete your meal, you'll never get dessert. And I think that therapy is that way. Healing is that way. That if we put boundaries on it and restrictions and say, you have to tell me the whole story and nothing but. And it has to be autobiographically correct with no air, margin of error whatsoever. And then we're going to complete every incomplete experience you ever had in your life, everyone to its fullest, before you can get dessert. That's a shamble. Mm. Because some people don't need, on that 0 to 10 scale that I love, they may be at 2 to 10, they may get to 5, 10, and never need to go any further. Because there's body can metabolize it. Yeah. And we don't need to do anymore. I don't need to go to the end of the to the end of the pier and jump in to know that the water's wet. <laughs> you know, it's all right there. We the are... body is so amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I love asking folks when they're like, you know, my my ear is ringing, you know, and I'm what sense do you make of that? Because oh. often they'll they'll be like, "What does this mean?" <laughs> and the, just like I'm just repeating what you just said, but every time I'm like, "Oh, that's so cool! What sense do you make of that?" And there is something that comes immediately from yeah. them, yeah. and I I would never want to take that from them. Somebody told me once. It's funny you said ringing in the ear. I said, "Well, what do you make of that? Well, what's that about?" And they said, without a beat, they said, "Oh, when my when I." My parents, when I was born, my parents lived next to a train track. And they told this whole long, elaborate story about trains passing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, and my mine was safety related. But that doesn't mean that that's what's no. true for you. Not at all. No. Everybody's story is everybody's story. Not my story and not your story. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really supporting the nervous system which supports the body <laughs> to process in its own time, in its own way. And the nervous system is the North star. So that's where we're, 
what we're supporting and following without the agenda. And that really puts the power back into the client. Totally. Yeah. Totally. If I tell you how to get to downtown Bend from where you live now, you're never going to learn how to get anywhere. But if I let you figure out how to get to downtown Bend, you're always going to know how to get anywhere in the world. You'll know how to get around. Just takes an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am just the biggest cheerleader for this work, not only as a practitioner, but it changed my relationship to myself and the world and still working on people in general. <laughs> I feel different in myself. I feel in myself. Mm. And it feels just like such an honor to sit with folks every day going, I know it seems very little, but it's amazing. And to get to see what happens, it mm. feels so compassionate. Well, I am grateful for you, Ms. Shelby. I mean, we've known each other a while now, and uh, I think we'll know each other a while longer. I think that, you know, I'm grateful for you. I appreciate what you're doing. You know, you're, you're an interesting one. You know, I know. <laughs> I know I'm on here for me, but I'm just going to say that, you know, I mean, for me, it being the one being interviewed, but I will say that, you know, you reach out to professionals, to doctors, lawyers, to all sorts of people that you touch and tell about trauma. And that group scares me still. I still go, ooh, and you do it. You reach out to other professionals of all categories, doctors, you know, psychiatrists, to psychotherapists, to body workers, all these people that you reach out. You work, you reach out to seasons professionals doing consultation work. And on top of all of that, you have an amazing retreat coming up at Panama <laughs> that you're going to be working with professionals there. So you, you are all about healing. And I, I'm just honored to be with you today and just support every spoke of your wheel, that complete wheel. There's no missing pieces in your wheel. It's complete. And you're doing terrific work in the trauma. Definitely in the trauma field, but in the whole healing field, the whole just being a good person field. Aww. That is so funny. I said to somebody on the phone last night, I'm working really hard on not needing to be a good person anymore. Not needing to be perceived as a oh. good person. So thank you for completing that spoke. <laughs> I can move on. <laughs> you can move on now. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, is there anything that you'd like folks to know about um, what you're offering, how they can find you, all of those things? The basic place, go to Austin Attach, www.austinattach, A-U-S-T-I-N-A-T-T-A-C-H.com. And click on trainings. You'll see a lot happening on trainings. Um, we're working on some stuff for some parenting programs coming through. Uh, still a little bit behind. Uh, have a couple books, Nurturing Resilience and TEB123, uh, which is great for parents. Uh, yeah, come see me. You know, I'll be somewhere teaching um, somewhere in the world. Come. Don't hesitate or do it online, or we now have it where you can do it individually if you can't make any of our programs, because we really want to get uh, this modality out there where people understand that, oh, I don't have to know so much. It yeah. just have to be me. Well, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>